All right, so I hope um, everyone is back. And now please join me in welcoming last two speakers, Jason De Souza and Lian Li from NAB. Jason is a senior architect and Lian is a senior analyst who both work in NAB's API gateway team, where they're always looking for ways to innovate their API technologies. Today, they will be talking about how they have been federating API development at Australia's largest business bank. Over to you, Jason and Lian. Hi, Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Um, so today we're gonna to share our journey on how we federated API development at NAB. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about us, our company, and my colleague, Lee and myself, uh, the opportunity we had two years ago, the solution that we came up with to federate API development in our organization. Lynn will give you a run through on how do we deploy the apps to our gateways. And I'll run through our developer portal a little bit. Uh, talk to you about the benefits and um, just share some learnings that we had that we've had over the last two years. So for those of you that don't know us, we're NAP. As Australia's largest business bank, we work with small, medium and large businesses. We're there from the beginning to support them through every stage of the business life cycle. Uh, my name is Jason D'Souza. I'm the senior architect for API Gateways at NAP. Uh, born and bred in Melbourne. Um, but I'm currently under lockdown. So all of us people in Melbourne, we've been under lockdown for the last, I don't know, two, three months. We'll see how we, how much longer we have to go with. So in my spare time, um, I've been training to be a barbecue pit master, uh, giving the old Weber a good, a good go. Um, and I'm the owner of the NAB API ecosystem. Lynn? Yep, so I'm Lynn and I'm a senior analyst engineer at NAB and I've been there for five years. Uh, I used to be an avid traveler um, so I'm really looking forward to the day when our borders are open again and I can once again uh, go out uh, adventuring. Uh, I look after the NAB API ecosystem, so I'm passionate about uh, keeping things running and making things as efficient as we, could, as we possibly can. Okay, so we'll jump right into um, the opportunity we had two years ago. So back then, um, our quickest API development was around six to eight weeks. We had a centralized development team um, working on a monolithic config. Uh, we were focused on our edge API gateways on our digital channels. Um, because we had a development team working on a monolithic config, we had a large amount of regression testing that was required for any change at all, which means we, we had to release in monthly cycles. It was a mature process, but was in a highly reg regulated environment. Um, and because of that, we had to do things in a certain way, but, there was no getting around that. We've actually had to, we've actually created a bottleneck for ourselves. We couldn't release as quick as our business required as we needed to, to help our customers and colleagues. So we had to change to align with that. And this is what we came up with. We decided that we would transform from a API development team who creates APIs to create, to create a platform for our developers to across the organization to create APIs for everybody else. This is our NAB API management platform, which it was a SaaS offering comprised of integrated tooling for our API consumers and publishers across the organization. It would focus on API design, deploying our APIs, running our APIs using our API gateways, managing them, and um, discovering the APIs that were created or are going to be created. Um, I'll run through our architecture of what we decided to come up with. This is what we call our NAB API architecture. We wanted a way for our service teams, our engineering teams, to be able to create APIs, not just for the external um, channels, but also for the organization. We wanted to API enable the entire organization. So what we did was we decided on creating this thing called a service API gateway. This is our internal API gateway for services to expose APIs across the organization. Each service team looks after their own service API gateway. They could have one on AWS or on Azure or both, depending on where they run their workload. They would manage their authorization permissions themselves using OAuth API scopes. 
you would have centralized management of our external client gateways, this is what we call them, to avoid clashes between teams. We have centralized session management. It's additional security required for our external gateways there as well. All um, matched together by, with our RDP, which runs across our organization. So I'm going to hand over to Lynn, who's going to give us a bit of a uh, run through on how do we deploy these APIs onto the API gateways. Uh, yeah, let me just share my screen. Uh, Jason, you might need to stop sharing before I can share mine. Uh, one second, technical problems. Hmm. It's not working for me. Maybe Jason, you can okay, share. I'll share for you. Yeah, go for it. Thanks. Okay. We are back on. <laughs> All right. Uh, so thanks, Jason. Uh, so as Jason said, I'm going to be talking about uh, the deployment part of creating an API. So one of the major ways that we uh, decrease um, the amount of time it takes to get an API into production is uh, look at how we can speed up and simplify our development process. So we identified a few areas which could uh, benefit from automation. So we built an automated CLI tool called Swagster, and uh, this helps to decrease the development effort in the following ways. Uh, it abstracts the gateway software and uh, infrastructure allowing developers outside of the API team to have full control over the creation and, and the management of their own APIs uh, without having to understand uh, the underlying uh, technical detail of the gateway. Uh, the tool also automates the enforcement of API standards, uh, ensuring consistency across all, of our stand uh, across all of our APIs without having to rely on all of our engineers having to keep up to date with the evolving standards. Uh, the tool also eliminates the need for separate files for API documentation and API gateway configuration, combining the two so that uh, developers can use their documentation as their gateway configuration. Similarly, uh, multiple config files that were used for different environments were combined into the one service config file uh, when using the tool, uh, making the management of multiple environments uh, much simpler. The tool also because the tool uses documentation as its input, it can also publish that documentation to Stargaze, which is our central API registry, uh, while it's doing deployments, uh, keeping our API documentation automatically up to date. And lastly, uh, the CLI tool makes uh, automating uh, deployments much easier since uh, CLI tools naturally integrate well uh, with CI CD pipelines. Uh, Jason, can you go to the next slide? Uh, so how does the CLI tool work? Uh, let's go through an example to understand it a bit better. So I'm going to be talking about a robot team in this example. And while this team and the robot functionality are going to be completely made up, uh, the, the process illustrated by this example uh, will be the same as the process that an actual NAB team would follow. So in our example, our robot team or tenancy has uh, several different uh, development scrum teams two of which are dev team one which is working on the robot talking service and dev team two which is working on the robot walking service so i'll be focusing mostly on angie and bob of dev team one today uh, but chris and danielle from dev team two will pop back up again briefly a little bit later uh, so angie and bob are both working on their talking service code uh, they're sharing a Git repository for their APIs, but they are working independently on their separate functions within the talking service. Uh, in this example, uh, they're also going to be using uh, different software platforms. So Angie could be using uh, Java code that's auto-generating her swaggers for her, while Bob is manually writing his swaggers and feeding API information to his Node.js code uh, from them. 
Idleway is going to be compatible with the CLI tool since it's only going to be looking at the swaggers uh, when it's doing API deployments. Uh, the only other file that it's going to require is the service config file, uh, which contains all of the environment specific variables. So together, the swaggers and the service config file will make up the talking service files, uh, which the CLI tool can then uh, use to deploy APIs onto uh, gateway environments. So the swaggers that uh, Bob and Angie are using are going to be a standard Swagger 2 or open API free uh, specification documentation. Uh, however, they will contain a little extra config uh, that's going to tell the CLI tool what gateway functionality to attach to each API. So uh, if we look at part of one of Angie's swaggers, we'll see boxed in red uh, several X Swagster configuration sections. And it's in these sections uh, where we would put all of our abstracted uh, gateway functionality configuration. So for example, uh, Angie wants all of the APIs within this swagger to be uh, rate limited at 100 TPS. So she would uh, configure the route rate limiting plugin at the top level X flags the object in the swagger. Uh, behind the scenes, the CLI tool and the gateway software are going to handle attaching rate limiting code to each one of the APIs that will be created out of this swagger. But Angie only really needs to uh, worry about what fields she needs to configure for this plugin. Uh, Angie also wants to uh, configure open ID style uh, validations with scope checking uh, to, be uh, to be done specifically on the get slash greeting route. And she also wants um, some uh, header transformations to happen uh, before that request is routed to the back ends. Uh, so she's going to configure the open ID connect and the request transformer plugins uh, in the XLAX object in that specific route. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so Angie and Bob have an extensive list of plugins that they can configure in their swaggers. Whoops, can we go back? Uh, Jason? Uh, one slide. Yeah, thank you. Oh. Uh, so uh, Angie and uh, Bob have an extensive list of plugins that they can configure in their swaggers. And uh, this will help them to implement any uh, token validation, scope validation, uh, throttling or API um, metrics that they need in their service gateways. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so Angie and Bob are going through their development cycle and their CI CD um, process might look a bit like this. So as they're making changes to their code, um, this is going to trigger uh, deployment pipelines, which is using the CLI tool to deploy the uh, talking service um, files from before onto the service, uh, the testing service gateway. So as the tool is doing this, it's firstly going to validate that all of the APIs in the swaggers are conform to the um, API standards. And uh, once it's done that, it will convert the swaggers and the X swagster objects uh, to uh, admin API calls on the test gateway. And this is going to uh, create the corresponding APIs uh, from the swaggers in that environment. So once the deployment is done, uh, testing can then be conducted on the testing gateway. Uh, if changes are needed, then the whole process would repeat. However, if changes aren't needed and uh, Angie and Bob are happy to move on to the next stage, um, they can then use the exact same service files to redeploy to any other environments where their APIs are needed. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is possible because uh, all of the environment specific uh, variables are included and grouped within the service config file. So the file contains a list of all the environments uh, which would be deployed to, and each environment would contain uh, the backend that should be routed to, and any uh, service and swagger variables that might be specific to that environment. So once Angie and Bob are ready to uh, deploy into the production service gateway, uh, they would tell their CLI tool uh, where their production service gateway endpoint is, as well as to use the prod service config uh, when doing deployments. Uh, so while this deployment is happening, uh, the CL 
CLI tool is going to detect that a production environment is being updated and will therefore also send the sluggers being deployed uh, to Stargaze in order to keep uh, the documentation there uh, in sync with what is actually in the gateways. Uh, so while Angie and Bob have been busy uh, working on the talking service, uh, Chris and Daniel, if you can remember from Dev Team 2, uh, have been working on the walking service simultaneously. And they've actually deployed their APIs into the service gateway a couple of days earlier uh, than Dev Team 1. Uh, this shouldn't matter since their APIs are sitting underneath a different service and the CLI tool knows not to touch any APIs that aren't actually being changed during deployments. So any existing APIs in the gateways should be able to uh, continue on uh, completely undisturbed by the new deployment being done by Dev Team 1. Uh, so as you can see, uh, different teams and developers can use the same uh, gateway environments uh, simultaneously without having to worry too much about um, coordinating deployments beforehand. And this makes uh, managing the service gateways a lot simpler for our developers. So once, uh, and oh, can we go back, Jason? Thanks. Uh, so Angie and Bob, uh, once they've finished their deployment, um, all of their talking service APIs should now be available on the service gateway. However, some of these APIs, such as the slash greeting API uh, from the saga before, will have um, Open ID Connect plugins uh, configured on them and will therefore require an, ac an access token uh, in order to be used. Um, so in order for the scope checks to pass for the Open ID Connect plugins, uh, the API caller must first retrieve the access token from the appropriate IDP service, and uh, that access token must also have uh, the correct scopes. Uh, scopes, uh, the creation and management of scopes are uh, uh, done in the IDP service. And one of the other ways that we've uh, made things easier for our developers is to, um, to automate IDP scope management and creation uh, in Stargaze, which uh, Jason is going to touch on a little bit later. Uh, so if you remember from Jason's diagram from before, uh, the service gateway is just one layer uh, within the API architecture. So once Angie and Bob have done their service gateway deployment, they would also want to deploy their swaggers uh, into the shared client gateway. So the shared client gateway is another way that we've simplified and abstracted things for developers. So while teams look after their own service gateways, uh, the, API the API team is responsible for uh, looking after the client gateway and uh, managing and abstracting uh, some of the more complicated um, IDP integrations, uh, as well as making sure that all of the services within the gateway uh, play well with one another. Uh, the separate gateway layers also make um, logging and creating reporting across all of the APIs uh, much simpler uh, for the developers to, to do. So once, so before redeploying um, to the client gateway, uh, Angie and Bob would want to switch out their service config file uh, for one that has backends that point to the robot service gateway. Uh, they'd also want to add in some plugins uh, to deal with session handling and token dereferencing. And while the CLI tool is deploying to the client gateway, it's going to make our developers' lives a bit easier by detecting that it is deploying to a client gateway and uh, filtering out the service gateway plugins and uh, altering the uh, API val validations accordingly. Uh, so once Angie and Bob have finished their uh, deployment to the client gateway, they'll probably want to test out their new functionality. But actually their uh, robot talking service was developed as part of a wider uh, robot notification project, which also involved the accounts management team. So Angie is going to uh, notify the accounts management team that they're ready for testing. And then one of their test users is going to uh, run a end-to-end -end test. So as part of that end-to-end -end test, they're going to call a login API on the client gateway um, and that login API will handle uh, retrieving access tokens and establishing user sessions in the background. Uh, the test user would then call a 
uh, robot talking API on the client gateway uh, in order to update some of his uh, robots talking configuration. So on the client gateway, uh, that request is going to have the appropriate access token attached to it, and it's going to be sent on to the corresponding API on the service gateway. Uh, on the service gateway, the OpenID Connect plugin is going to check that that access token has the appropriate scopes to access that particular API. And if so, it's going to route it to the backends where the actual configuration update is executed. Uh, the test user would then deposit some money into his account uh, using the account management APIs. So once again, um, those APIs are going to go through the client gateway, uh, be checked on the account management service gateway, and then the actual account balance update will be done in the service backends. Uh, as part of that update, a call to a talking API on the robot gateway is going to be uh, done. And this is going to successfully prompt the uh, test user's robot to say something like, thank you for the $10 uh, deposit. You are now $100 away from your savings target. So then uh, Dev Team 1 would then celebrate with uh, the account management team for having successfully delivered um, the robot notification functionality into production. Uh, so that's what's happening during the development and the deployment phase of uh, creating an API. But what about the planning phase where you want to discover APIs that are already uh, available to use? So I'm going to be handing back to Jason, who's going to be talking a bit more about this. Cool. So now we've deployed our APIs. Let's have a look at how do we, how do we find them and how do we manage them. So this is our API developer portal, which we call Stargaze. It's focused on search to encourage reuse of our APIs. Our engineers, architects, and business stakeholders um, can discover all of our APIs which have been designed in their own development or have ultimately been implemented into production. The APIs are segregated into um, multiple namespaces and categories to give further context for the user to go and find what they need faster. Let's have a look at our open API, um, open API. Open Banking Accounts API. Okay. So we ended nicely um, using Redox Open API spec. In when it, when it's when it loads up, the user can choose the environment that they want to see the spec in. As we're doing in development, we'll find that we might have different versions of the same, same different revisions of the same version uh, deployed to different environments. So we can um, see which spec we're working on at any one time. And also, we can see the version that we need to work on as well. Uh, it's documented clearly for any any developer to go and have a look at um, what this API is. How do I use it? We have samples, all part of the open API spec. And um, we have the API scope that's required to get access to the API. So if I wanted to get access to this API, how do I do it? This is the general process which, which our developers go through. Uh, as a once-off activity, if, if they're new to the team, they get access to the developer portal to be able to uh, request access and create uh, clients to get to um, work on APIs with. Once they do that, they create their client. Um, if they're creating a service type client, they'll receive a uh, client ID in credential, the client ID in, client ID in secret. Uh, they request scopes for the API that they want to get access to, or APIs. On, re on request of the scope, an email will be sent to the API um, owner or the approver who needs to approve the API if they're happy with the request. And uh, once that's done, the scope will be automatically applied to the client within their IDP. So let's have a look at what that looks like. This is our API client management screen. I'm in the API Gateways team, so I'll get to see all of the clients within API Gateways. Uh, I've created a client here before called Jason's API, API Days Demo in Test01 environment. But let's just go through what it takes to create a client. So um, if I want to create a client, I'll go back here, click create a client. I get to choose the type of my client. For this purpose, for this demo, we're going to do service. I put the name of my client in, I put some information about the audience that I want to be able to uh, use this client, um, some extra information, some notes, um, and maybe even in this form, I can also request for the scope that I need access to. Um, there's a couple more pages in that, so I've skipped ahead because we're running short on time. But this is what a form looks like when I've made a request for a scope. So I'm an API Gateways team. I've made a request in the Test01 environment to get access to the Open Banking Accounts Basic Read Scope. 
Um, it's been reviewed by the open banking team who's approved my request. And now my new client can access the open banking API, um, accounts API. Um, the other thing in our API developer portal is it offers us a way to manage our APIs. Um, so like Lynn was saying, it, we have tooling to support the full life cycle of our API. So if, we, if we're designing an API from the start, we have integrated tooling um, within our portal. So you can create a new API here, which will open up uh, an OS3 editor. You can move the life cycle along. Um, so it has a bit of a workflow in terms of, okay, at the start, you've got a draft API, moves to a candidate, approved, rejected. Um, when it gets deployed to a test environment, it, it's automatically marked as it's in development. Um, when it's deployed, deployed to production, it gets marked as implemented. And if you create future versions, you can mark the API as deprecated so that your developers or your consumers know that this isn't the API to be using anymore, it should be upgrading to the next version up. Um, lastly, I just wanted to quickly talk through some benefits and learnings that we've had. Um, so this is the stats screen. Um, so we've had quite uh, a lot of benefit from doing this. So 92% um, increase in capability to deliver new APIs and new versions of APIs since we started this program of work. Um, it's unlocked our capability to deliver more and faster, which is what the intention was, um, but also unlocked innovation as it's cheaper and easier to do things. Um, so it's cheaper and easier for the developer to go and build things as there's a lot, there's a lot more configuration and build, but also um, there's less organizational lag in terms of having to request another team to do some work for us. It, it, our teams can do that themselves, but I can go and experiment and get things done quicker. Um, we had a really good outcome um, as part of our uh, COVID-19 response. Um, one of the things that we were dealing with was uh, an influx in requests for our JobKeeper um, uh, stuff. So we quickly uh, were able to develop some APIs within about three days, which just would not have been possible um, in our old architecture. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk about is uh, just to share some learnings before we close up. Um, so a couple of things that we wanted to really share was um, if you are to, if you want to federate and create a CLI, invest early and often into automated governance. Our CLI is our tool for automated governance. Um, it's used to govern and imply any, uh, any so it's our linting and governance checks to make sure that our APIs comply to our standards. Um, and we're not going to get it right on day one. What you'll find is that things that you expect your developers to know, they may not know, so you need to build extra, extra, extra tooling and extra governance into your tooling. Um, understand your value proposition. It's really important if you are going to, if you are going to build a platform to um, you know, appoint a product owner who can work with your customers to deliver value that's most needed right now. You don't always know what your customers need, your internal customers, so go out there and ask and work with them. And um, the last thing to share is when you have a sense of excellence and you federate out, you need to go out there and identify the teams that need to be built up. You need to build the engineering capability within those teams. So education, um, community practices, you know, all those types of things, um, self-service documentation. There's a, there's, there's a lot of things you can do in terms of helping teams and bringing them up and building their capability to develop great APIs. Um, so last thing I want to say was thanks for joining. Um, you know, happy to, to share, you know, our API management platform, our CLI for automated governance pipeline integration and um, how it makes API development easy. Um, and next steps for us are um, looking at integrating multi-protocol support into our platform. So we've got async API coming up um, and GraphQL discovery, data model management and multi-cloud optimization. Um, so I'll leave it up to questions. I know we ran a little bit over time. Thank you, um, Jason and Leon, for the informative speech. So there are quite a lot of um, questions running in the chat. Um, I will select some of them. So um, Roy was asking that um, he wasn't clear on the difference between client gateways and service gateways. So what is the exact difference? And does traffic pass through both generally, or they have different responsibilities? Yeah, traffic, traffic, um, let me stop sharing this. So traffic, traffic definitely goes through both. Um, so our client gateways are like our edge gateways, uh, anything for a human interactive or partner. Um, but the, the majority, the bulk of the API policies are within our service API gateways. The client gateways are there to um, to resolve conflicts and routes and, and have a centralized session management. So we have a very light API gateway on our edge. 
which goes through our uh, service gateways, which are managed by the service team. So we, our architecture wanted to focus on giving the, the choice up to the, the service team to manage their API policies rather than having a central team to manage their API policies for them. And um, Darren was asking that um, is the only reason for Swagger to abstract um, from the underlying API gateway or there are other factors? No, so um, we, we, we do want to have that architectural purely in terms of being able to swap API gateways out. But um, there is a big part of it is that is the API automated governance. So the linting that, um, that Lynn's built for, for us, um, you know, a lot of that is really important um, to, to make sure that we have good quality APIs coming out every time. And the integration into our, our ecosystem. So we have integration into, the API gate, into our API gateways and also our developer portal as well. Um, since we're running out of time, so there is the last question for you guys. Um, does the published OAS document, which is consumed by API clients, contain the gateway policies? Yes, 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 it does. So, I mean, Lynn, do you want to talk about it? Um, the the X works uh, on annotations that we've included in OAS three spec. Oh yes, yeah. so both Swagger two and OAS three um, works with the CLI tool. Um, it's the same um, gateway abstraction, so they'd be using the exact same plugins um, for both. Yeah, so if you wanted to rate limit, I don't know, that's an API policy, right? Rate limit to 50 TPS, that would be in the annotations in the API spec. Awesome. Um, thank you again, Jason and Leon. Um, there are also a quite few um, questions left out in the chat. Um, so could you please um, spare some time and answering the questions in the chat, please? And um, thanks everyone for attending this session. Um, you all have 30 minute break um, to stretch your legs, get a cup of tea and meet other attendees. So there is workshop run table um, running and also the sponsor booths um, in the partner village tab on the left hand side bar. And next session will kick off at 2.50 PM and hope you enjoy the rest of API day.